So I would like to start. Uh, so I would like to start. We have uh, our today uh, a talk as part of the Barilel Colloquium for the history and uh, History, philosophy, and sociology of the, of the sciences, together with the, uh, which is organized together with the Edelstein Center and the, at the Ivy University and the Van Leer uh, Institute of Jerusalem. And if I remember correctly, it's the first real talk that we have a visitor coming from abroad since the COVID here uh, in this under this uh, process of giving a talk here. We, last year we still we had two plants that they were removed to uh, do. So I'm, I'm very happy that uh, we can actually do it. And our uh, speaker who came from quite far from uh, Boston is Harriet uh, Ritvo. She's a professor of history emerita at MIT. Uh, she works in the fields of environmental history, the history of human animal relations. Uh, British Empire history and the history of natural history, the history of natural history. Uh, she received her uh, PhD degree from Harvard University. She's the author of quite a few books. I will mention the last two: uh, The Down of the Green, uh, Manchester Filmer and Modern Environmentalism, which was appeared in 2009, and uh, Platy and the Platypus and the Marmaid and other uh, figment of classif classifying imagination, which was published in 1997. The talk that we will hear today, Ability, Greed, and Wildness is part of her new book project, and we will hear more about it uh, today. So thank you very much for coming uh, to speak to us. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, the variation of animals and plants under domestication appeared in 1868, and like much of what Darwin wrote after 1859. It offered additional evidence for a single aspect of the argument that had been summarized or distilled or unduly compressed, at least as, as Darwin saw it, as he rushed to complete on the origin of species. So variation presented, provided Darwin with ample scope to buttress his discussion of artificial selection, which functioned as an important heuristic in the origins argument about the theory of evolution by natural selection. And when I say ample, that may be actually understating it, because as you can see, variation is about twice as long as the origin, which may be one reason why it's half as well known. Now, lagomorphs, that is, members of the mammalian order that includes rabbits and hares, as well as uh, more remotely, Pikes, which are like rabbits, but they have short ears and no tail. Anyway, lagomorphs don't figure prominently in, um, uh, in Darwin's survey of domestication. And just to remind you, this is mammalian taxonomy, and you can see the uh, lagomorphs right there uh, branching off from the rodents just a little bit after we did. Um, So um, this is a more traditional uh, museum exhibit about them. That's from the University of Michigan Zoology Museum. Anyway, the first volume of um, variation, which is devoted to a species by species survey of domesticated animals and plants, includes a fairly brief chapter on rabbits. And in the second, in the second volume, which treats scientific issues associated with, with domestication thematically, references to them pop up from time to time. 
Now, within this relatively restricted compass, there are two mentions, widely separated and somewhat inconsistent, of hybrids between the rabbit and the hare. In the overview of domesticated rabbits in the first volume, Darwin speculated about a possible hare contribution to their ancestry. He says, we may infer with safety that all the domestic breeds are the descendants of the common wild species of rabbit. But from what we hear of the marvelous success in France in rearing hybrids between the hare and the rabbit, it's possible, but not probable, from the great difficulty in making uh, the first cross. So this wasn't the technical situ uh, situation I was anticipating. Uh, no, sorry, no. <laughs> So who, who can't hear me? Can, can you raise your hands? It's just a bit. Oh, uh, it's not my Boston accent. Okay, I'll try and shout. You can also come closer. What? Yeah. If you don't hear, just come close. <laughs> That's the okay. So back to Darwin. He said, but what from, from what we hear of the marvelous success in France in re rearing hybrids between the hare and the rabbit, it's possible, though not probable, from the great difficulty in making the first cross, that some of the larger races, which are colored like a hare, may have been modified by process with this animal. Now, this brief quotation alludes to several contentious issues faced by people concerned with the theory and practice of animal breeding in the 19th century. But for now, I'll just emphasize the lack of explicit skepticism in Darwin's reference in this first volume to the rabbit hair crosses. Um, that is to say, I don't think he was being ironical at this point in his use of the word marvelous, although I would say there's a certain carefulness or conditionality about the tone of that quotation I just read as a whole. The accompanying note is even more credulous. It simply refers to Dr. P. Broca's interesting memoir on this subject. And this is a French uh, pamphlet that was one of the sources for reports on the uh, French successes in interbreeding pairs and rabbits. And this is, of course, the same Paul Broca, uh, who's commemorated in the Broca's area of the brain, perhaps more relevant to my topic today, is his work on what he understood as human hybridity, which may have been inspired or encouraged by his observation of what he understood about Lagavore hybrids. Anyway, when Darwin returned to this topic in his second volume, his attitude does seem to have altered somewhat. In the course of a general discussion of the impact of captivity on the fertility of wild animals, he noted that the common hare, when confined, has, I believe, never bred in Europe, although according to a recent statement, it has crossed with the rabbit. In his supporting note, uh, which uh, showed a newly qualified understanding of the reliability of these kind of accounts, he cited critical responses to the same French report. He said, although the existence of the leperide, as described by Dr. Broca, has been positively denied, yet Mr. Pigot, another, another Frenchman, uh, affirms that the hare and the rabbit have produced hybrids. Now, many of Darwin's contemporaries shared his interest in these alleged hybrids and also his ambivalence about the possibility of their existence. And this is just, in case you're not familiar, uh, a comparison of hares and rabbits. Um, debate about the veracity or plausibility of claims to have produced leporids, as they were confusingly called, but it's confusing since leporid 
uh, refers to members of the family Lacordae, um, rumbled on for years in Britain and elsewhere, and not just within the scientific community. For example, the Cornhill Magazine, a general audience magazine, in uh, 1860 reported that a Monsieur Roux of Angoulême each year sends to market upwards of a thousand of his leperies. And four years later, the Journal of the Royal Agricultural Society of England, that is so an agricultural journal, published an elaborate account of Mr. Roux's <coughs> techniques, along with some references to still less well-documented <laughs> accounts of rabbit hair hybrids produced also in France as much as a century earlier. In 1871, the Church of England magazine, so an ecclesiastical journal, also weighed in, citing not only the skepticism of some naturalists who felt that when alleged hybrid offspring <laughs> were examined, it became increasingly evident, they said, that the evidence of the paternal hair fell short, fell far short of what had been attributed to him. And they also claim, implying, I would say, an unusual taxonomic standard, that when eaten, an alleged hybrid did not appear to differ from a simple rabbit. And I should emphasize, these were people who knew what hairs tasted like. Um, and here again, however, there was an alternative French opinion. The official 1862 guide to the Paris Zoo in Bois de Boulogne uh, noted that the menagerie included several leperies, and according to their donor and their breeder, their flesh was similar to that of ordinary rabbits, but also emitted a distinctive smell. Now, although the Encyclopedia Britannica definitively announced in 1886 that animals sold as leperies actually belonged to a large breed of rabbit, confusingly called Belgian hares, that was far from the last word on the subject. As late as 1925, William Castle, who was a professor of zoology at Harvard, um, and his distinctions included <coughs> being the first experimenter to use Drosophila uh, in genetic research. Uh, but he wrote a whole book entitled The Genetics of Domestic Rabbit, a manual for students of mammalian uh, genetics. He felt called upon to publicly debunk the leperides in the American Naturalist and is now an important uh, zoological journal. He said, we may accordingly relegate the hare rabbit to the limbo of zoological myths along with the unicorn and the sea serpent. Now, of course, we <coughs> don't have to look far for evidence that the authority of science can be insufficient to combat strongly held alternative positions. I mean, the continuing debates about evolution, about climate change, the recent uh, discussions of vaccination, um, often the most obvious current examples, I would say. And the news item posted on the PetMD website on a recent April 1st offers oblique evidence that rabbit hybridization is still a live issue, at least in some quarters. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> Although at present, rabbit hybridization has become a niche concern in the middle of the 19th century, interest in the leperies clearly extended um, far beyond the ranks of pet rabbit fanciers or commercial rabbit breeders. Because among other things, despite their ob obvious similarities, hybridization between hares and rabbits had proved challenging, reports of a possible breakthrough resonated with a range of other concerns about hybridity. And just to be clear, the reason why it was difficult to produce a hare rabbit hybrid is because as Professor Castle asserted over a century ago, it's not possible, <laughs> uh, at least by natural. <coughs> so that is to say, the reason that the leopards attracted such relatively widespread and sustained attention reflects their categor categorization not as lagomorphs or leopards, but as hybrids. And as hybrids in the news, they were far from unique. The 19th century British public flocked to admire hybrid superstars, like the litters of lion, tiger, cubs, uh, produced um, in, uh, as 
in Thomas Atkins's menagerie. They toured, they toured the country in the 1820s and 30s. But even relatively humdrum hybrids were considered uh, worthy of notice. So zookeepers routinely produced, or that is to say they didn't produce them, but they encouraged the production of hybrids between different bovine species, different simian species, the particular pairings basically determined by um, uh, whoever happened to be living in their cages and paddocks at the time. And still less remarkable combinations were also considered worthy of notice. So in 1851, notes and queries reported that a French she-wolf who had been reared with a hound pack has had and reared a litter of pups by one of the dogs and does duty by um, hunting. And dog wolf hybrids are not unusual at all. In fact, you can buy them on eBay. Um, the proceedings of the Zoological Society of London noted in 1899 that some living spe specimens of supposed hybrids between the stoat, uh, Mustella erminia, and the ferret, Mustella furo, had been exhibited at a recent meeting. The reason for the qualifying supposed is that probably they were actually ferret polka hybrids, which are analogous to uh, wolf dog hybrids since the ferret is a domesticated form of the polecat. Pol um, well documented examples of ferret stoke hybrids are as elusive as actual leopards. Um, Okay, you missed, you missed the real ferret polecat hybrids, but this is a ferret rabbit hybrid. Um, no, 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 this one. Yeah, that one. Okay, yeah, those are the real ones. Not so surprising. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is more surprising, but no. <laughs> so, um, So pronounced was the public interest in this kind of combination that Punch Humor Magazine was moved to satirize it in 1870. It said, the rhinoceros in Mr. Lyons' menagerie last night presented the elephant with a fine fold. This is the first instance on record of a pachydermatis hybrid, which should it fortunately survive, will doubtless prove no small uh, attraction to zoologists. Now, most of these celebrity hybrids were produced to satisfy curiosity or for the love of tinkering, put another way. But some celebrity hybrids were produced with more serious purposes. For example, the Scottish zoologist James Cosser Ewart, uh, an unusual late Victorian scientist who broke many boundaries, including that between science and agriculture. Um, as well as between experts and the public and between different animal species. Well, that was him with his, his zebra. Um, he, he conducted elaborate um, experiments to disprove the theory of telegraphy or the influence of the first sire, which held that um, the, the father of a female animal, or actually a female human, in some, some versions, first child left some trace of himself behind so that he was in some sense the father of all her subsequent offspring, even if he had departed from this earth uh, in the interim. Now, by Ewart's time, advances in the scientific understanding of mammalian reproduction had conclusively disproved this theory. Um, but breeders continued to operate as though it were true, as a few actually even do to this day, which is a thought-provoking example of the appeal of entrenched ideas, even when their ap application has direct economic costs. Anyway, you were undertook a series of experiments to persuade retrograde breeders of their mistake. So the most famous evidence in support of telegony had been provided by an early 19th century mayor called, um, whose first Pole had been sired by a, a quagga, so a relative of a zebra. Um, and his subsequent, his subsequent foals showed some evidence of striping, which is a reflection of atavism in horses, not, not of telegraphy. Um, anyway, so uh, Ewart produced a series of zebra hybrids 
So zebras are close to clouds um, with horses and ponies uh, because the cloud was extinct. So this is um, this is a quagga, one of the last ones uh, that died in, in a European zoo. And this is um, an alleged uh, uh, evidence of telegony. So a horse with a few little stripes here and there. So you had attempted to make contact with general audiences in many ways. Uh, he even invited school groups to his farm uh, outside Edinburgh, to, uh, where he conducted his breeding experiments. He published his results in a wide range of periodicals, as well as in books and, and pamphlets. But the climax of his sustained and energetic efforts to attract public attention was the exhibit he, he mounted at the 1900 show of the Royal Agricultural Society of England, which was held that year at York. Despite the fact that the visitors have to pay a supplementary charge of sixpence, uh, the zebra hybrids were the hit of the show. Wait, that's a zebra. There we go. That's one of his hybrids and uh, his mother. Um, so they seemed exotic indeed among the familiar farmyard animals. So emissaries from the more glamorous world of sideshows and menageries. The display, which also included subsidiary exhibits of hybrid pigeons, rabbits, and cats, but those were intervariety or inter interbreed crosses rather than interspecies hybrids. Of course, it wasn't presented in the flashy register of sideshows at, at menageries. Uh, on the contrary, it was mounted in sober scientific terms, uh, more reminiscent of a natural history museum. But like many creators, uh, Ewart was unable to control his audience's responses and interpretation. So the intense public interest aroused by these animals reflected preoccupations that were different from his own, where he aspired to the rationalization of stock breeding, the enrichment of traditional agricultural practice with the rarefied wisdom of science. Most of his fellow citizens were simply fascinated by miscegenation. There was also some sense that zebra horse hybrids might be useful along the lines of the mule, that is especially in parts of Africa where the susceptibility of European livestock to uh, the sleeping sickness carried by the tsetse fly uh, severely restricted colonial settlements. This hope, uh, forlorn as it turned out to be in this case, was not without precedent for almost a century Zoological tinkerers had speculated that hybridization might produce such practical benefits. In the 1830s, the prospectus of the London Zoological Society had included as one of its aims the introduction of new and curious subjects of the animal kingdom to enhance and diversify existing British livestock. And in its earliest years, the zoo uh, maintained a suburban farm from which wealthy breeders could purchase or rent the services of, as they called, uh, studs of various ungulate and avian types to enhance their own herds and flocks. Now, the animals at the zoo farm weren't different in kind or kinds from the animals at the Regents Park Zoo, but the range of species was significantly smaller and there was room for more individuals of each one. So, so this you can see this is a map of the zoo farm, and you, you can see that it's organized very differently than a, a kind of postage stamp uh, zoo. Um, the animals there included various species of deer, sheep, goats, zebras, kangaroos. I don't know who they thought the kangaroos were going to make, but um, zebu, zebu cattle, uh, ducks, and geese. And he was a zebu. Um, so allowing for a few flights of imaginative fancy, they were close allies of the domesticated animals that occupied British farms and fields. In its 1829 annual report, the Council of the Zoo defined the objectives of the farm expansively to include providing a retreat for animals who found the menagerie environment stressful, 
and conducting this pro uh, conducting experiments in all matters relating to breeding and points of animal physiology connected therewith. But the core aim of the farm was much more focused, um, effecting improvements in the quality or properties of domesticated quadrupeds and birds used for the table, and likewise in domesticating subjects for, from our own or foreign countries, which have hitherto not been inmates of our poultry or farmyards. So this was the reason why the zoo farm circulated a questionnaire to poultry breeders <coughs> asking them to rate various types of domesticated fowls and game birds with regard to such quality as beauty, productivity, and courage. Why it mated zebras with donkeys to see if the resulting hybrids were better in some way, and why it responded positively to requests like the following. The Duke of Bedford presents his compliments to the secretary of the, zoo, of the Zoological Society and begs to know whether he can spare him a Seriopsis male goose. Now, as it turned out, the farm's first years were its only years. Maintaining live animals was and is expensive, and the Young Society's finances were, in any case, fragile. By 1832, the uh, society had begun to auction off the farm animals. They'd all been sold by a couple of years later. They didn't fetch impressive prices, especially in comparison with the stud fees that the farm had been charging. For example, a pair of Chinese geese uh, sold for 10 shilling, and a, a, a female elk sold for four, four guineas. So stud fees had ranged from five shillings for the services of a zebu to two pounds for those of a zebra. And even those were trifling in comparison with the fees that were fetched by elite bulls and rams and stallions of ordinary, ordinary breeds and species. Now, although this failure or set of failures may have been definitive in one sense, in another, it wasn't catastrophic. That is, it mostly showed that the zoo wasn't the appropriate home for this kind of endeavors and that the market for exotic domesticates or for potential domesticates was limited. Differently situated and institutionalized, um, interest in the farm's agenda and attempts to realize it persisted through the 19th century. After all, the farm at the zoo wouldn't have existed at all if some of the zoo's wealthy and influential patrons hadn't desired to avail themselves of the stud surface services and surplus animals that it was established to offer. And after the institutionalized support of the zoo was withdrawn as before, they can, these people continued to pursue their interests in domestication and hybridization on their own estates. For example, at his Nosley Park menagerie, the 13th Earl of Derby produced hybrids between several Asian pheasant species and the local pheasant population, which ha had ultimately come from Asia also, but a long time. Previously, this is some of his pheasants. And he also produced a hybrids among all four uh, species of South American camelids, of which two are domesticated and two are wild. And this is his alpacas. Um, he maintained a breeding herd of elands, which are the largest and meatiest of um, the antelopes, a persistent object of gustatory desire. So he was most interested in creatures that people, or at least some people, would like to eat. And as was the case in many spheres of endeavor, in the course of the 19th century, such heroic individual efforts were increasingly subordinated to public or institutional ones. The institutions that emerged in um, response to this persistent desire to, um, uh, to integrate attractive exotic uh, attributes into domestic farms and bloodlines were called economization societies. Their focus on consumption, that is to say ingestion, was equally strong. So the members of an Australian society, in Australia actually was where these societies flourished uh, most, um, for example, hoped that antelopes would offer a change from the monotony of beef and mutton, and that the appealingly large South American curacao could supplement more, um, more pedestrian fowl. They further claimed that the flesh of the wombat 
is always a great treat. The opossum is good, especially when curried or stewed. And the monitor lizard, if one could overcome the repugnance of its appearance, is delicate and excellent food. Now, of course, none of these were targets for domestication or, of course, hybridization. Now, hybridization, or at least the combination or blurring of categories, could have figurative as well as literal force. That is, the desire to eat wild animals, of course, wasn't new in the 19th century, um, nor were the categorical questions that arose when that desire was juxtaposed with the desire to maintain <coughs> and easy access, whether within an animal's genome or within a park or other delimited space. So the category of game, animals to be hunted, has been persistently unstable as well as socially contested. So here it's the most noble game. Um, so to give one example, in the 1717 edition of his treatise of the forest laws, originally written in the late 16th century and republished and revised many times into the early 19th century, John Manwood listed the animal for whom a forest uh, was a privileged place. Now, and his definition of forest, a little surprising uh, to, to modern um, ears, he called it a territory of woody grounds and fruitful pastures. But anyway, privileged place, which I mean, which meant that only, only certain people could kill them there. Um, so that sounds like forest was a privileged place for people, not, not so much for, for, for animals. In any case, among these allegedly privileged creatures, he included what he called beasts of the forest, which were um, some deer uh, and hares, beasts of the chase or venery, and uh, another kind of deer, and also the fox, and beasts and fowls of war, which included also uh, the hare and the rabbit and uh, pheasants and partridges. And these general categories exist in most hunting guides, but as is the case with the general category of game, the species that they include tend to vary somewhat. But the guides concur in granting the stag, which usually meant the, the male of the red deer, pride of place, both in the venatic and the color, culinary hierarchy. Even in its ultimate disaggregated condition, that is as venison, the stag has tended to retain his aristocratic aura because of its relative scarcity or its inaccessibility, or to put it another way, because of its association with class privilege, as well as the complicated cachet of wildness, game meat has traditionally outranked the flesh of conventionally domesticated livestock. It's been prized for attributes especially its strong taste that are disparaged in lesser meat, uh, which may be an example, of, let's say an example of my men, um, of the way that abstract assertion of difference when the goal is to establish, uh, uh, the way that abstract assertion of difference can overshadow any emphasis, any assessment of the quality or content of that difference when the goal is to establish or emphasize hierarchy. So the connotation of the adjective gaming, uh, whether considered in its literal or physical senses, can range from the most appreciative to the least, depending on the noun that it modifies. But with regard to the spoils of the hunt, it has inevitably been, invariably been positive. This was the case even at the less majestic uh, end of the game continuum, thus hare was considered superior to rabbit. Uh, being, this is a quote from uh, a, a domestic advice manual, being much more savory and of a higher flavor. Um, so this was, as I mentioned earlier, the reason that judicious eaters thought they were able to tell the difference between a cooked rabbit and a cooked hare. Um, but the preference was most forcefully enunciated with respect to the most imposing animals. So a plain spoken Victorian cookbook divided lovers of venison into two categories, it says there were those who like it a little gone and those who like it a great deal. This state of putrescency, this is quote, is called by Gourmand's oak boot, high tasted and we should rather say at once stinking. So gamey 
but they might be uh, British deer, and especially those that ended up on the table, have, have almost all lived in some form of confinement, at least since the vivaria that the Romans built to enclose the fallow deer that they bought, brought with them across the channel. Over the centuries, the spaces devoted to deer have taken, have taken many forms, and they have also varied greatly in size. What they've had in common has been some degree of management. And this is a fairly extreme degree at a modern tourist attraction. But even the wildest, which is to say the least intensively managed, um, have required supplemental feeding, for example, in the harshest winter weather. Hay, beans, and turnips were suggested by one expert, not exactly their natural diet. And their territory is, at least in intention, defended from unauthorized human and non-human predators. The landscape itself may require management. For example, a Victorian handbook advised your park owners on the drainage of marshy areas to avoid foot rot, which is something that deer like sheep are vulnerable to. And it went on to offer additional advice that could as easily have appeared in a guide aimed at the owners of a domestic livestock. In particular, without the infrastructure of pedigree and shows, it emphasized breeding. Um, the importance of what it called good original stock, the need to cull male fawns and castrate stags, whose contribution to the herd's future would be undesirable. Of course, they were perfectly edible. And the need to avoid the excessive inbreeding that might lead to diminished size and vigor. Although, as was the case with regard to ordinary cattle and sheep, experts disagreed on the desirability of crossing versus that of maintaining a pure local strain. Now, as with other cases, other uh, tastes associated with social prestige, the desire to consume the wild has tended to spread. Although black markets and gray markets tend not to be well documented, I think it's safe to say that even when the game laws were most rigorously enforced, venison, pheasant, and other restricted meats were always available for people who could substitute money for legitimate access. But that traditional need for subterfuge has uh, disappeared in recent years as following a logic similar to that encountered in places like South Africa, people concerned with the preservation of British wildlife have begun to encourage their exploitation for purposes other than sport hunting and ecotourism. For example, the British Game Alliance, which concentrates on birds, has been established as the official marketing board for the UK game industry. It promotes both hunting and farming while ensuring consumers that the meat they buy meets rigorous ethical standards. And they have a significant latent demand. Ordinary consumers no longer have to uh, settle for the vicarious satisfactions of chicken chasseur or chicken cacciatore, hunter's chicken. Um, and also, of course, there are plenty of recipes for making beef taste like venison. Um, now, uh, the factitious quality of these dishes is ma manifest in their labels, and I don't think I don't think most hunters would target either chickens or cows. Although, of course, it's not unheard of. Um, but the gustatory thrill of the chase is available now not only at specialist game butchers, and this is a famous one in the Oxford uh, covered market, but um, conveniently encased in plastic for human eaters and those of other species. So, uh, for people and for, for dogs. Mm -hmm. um, this kind of packaging does undermine some of the traditional cachet of wildness, to put it uh, mildly. Um, and in the US, it's possible that the meat of beefalo, which is hybrid between the or ordinary cattle and American bison, may have a similar kind of appeal, although it's also praised as leaner than beef and therefore healthier. I don't know whether there's any analog to this kind of uh, hybridization at, at the grocery store in, um, in, in Israel. But anyway, um, it's possible too that, that the elite cachet may be perceived at least by advocates of mass gain consumption as of the diminishing desirability. So several years ago, 
the British Game Alliance introduced pheasant and quail ready meals to supermarkets as part of the campaign to lose their posh meat uh, image. But those are things you can buy part of. But to return to the past, as late as 1901, with regard to the hybridization that was literal rather than figurative, Punch was still satirizing the impulse, impulse towards ingestion, noting that the United States Fisheries Commission are making efforts to evolve uh, some hybrid fish of an entirely new type by mixing the eggs at spawning time. Another marvel that we, marvel with, will be produced is, by, is the turtle with an edible shell by crossing the soft shell crab with a carrot. Now it's interesting that the second item sim simply imagines a preposterous parent uh, as the, uh, whereas the first item actually describes something that did happen. Um, but the punch is suggesting that uh, these two were uh, implicitly equivalent. Now, punch is not necessarily the first place to look for information about the March of 19th and early 20th century science, but it is a more reliable indicator of which scientific developments caught the public eye or hit a public nerve and of what at least some members of the public thought about them. Whether the mixtures were actual or imagined, 19th century discussions of hybridization and acclimatization foreshadowed many issues that remain controversial. After all, um, a version was far from the whole 19th century story as it is uh, from the whole story now. The tone of the punch notices is indulgently humorous rather than scathingly so, and punch certainly was capable of vicious derision when it felt that was warranted. So the combinations they proposed were unlikely, to put it mildly, and so they constituted no, no real threat. The satiric, satiric targets were the hybridizers, the, the scientists who studied the fruits of their labors, and just possibly the general audience, including punch, punch readers, who flocked to admire such curiosities. These inconsistencies were the combination of more than a century of mixed reaction. The occasional production of crosses between kinds of wild animals or between domesticated and wild animals echoed the routine practices of breeders of livestock and pets. The analogy, as I said, that Darwin had used in support of his uh, theory of evolution by natural selection in, in the origin. But that is to say, it echoed it in some ways. On the surface, improvement seemed like the opposite of hybridization, since it normally aimed to enhance the strengths and the distinctiveness of um, individual breeds through extreme inbreeding. But from its beginning, the discourse of improvement also acknowledged that this method could not be applied monolithically. Sometimes uh, the acknowledgement was explicit, especially in the origin stories of breeds. After all, foundation stock had to come from someplace. Um, the frequently rehearsed, the most famous uh, example is the um, emergence of the English thoroughbred horse as, um, as a mid 18th century or 19th century agricultural encyclopedia put it, although it cannot, it cannot admit of a doubt that the English trained horse is more beautiful and far swifter and stouter than the justly famed coursers of the desert, it could not be considered a pure or indigenous production. On the contrary, it was, as they said, a foreign extraction improved and perfected by the influence of climate and diligent cultivation. Indeed, the names by which the three founding sires, theoretically the sires of all existing thoroughbred horses today, um, the names by which they were known emphasize their exotic prominence, although actually uh, inaccurately. Um, so they were called the Darley Arabian, the Byerly Turk, and the Godolphin Barb, who was also known as the Godolphin Arabian, which shows um, uh, the geographical imprecision at play. So this is, um, this is the bio return. And sometimes the acknowledgement was veiled or even covert as when fresh blood was introduced into a breed to correct a defect or accommodate changing pace. So a pro prolific canine journalist who wrote under the name of Stonehenge 
disparage the black and tan setter. Black and tan setter. Um, which was also known as the Gordon Setter in comparison to other breeds because its gait, which was heavy and hound like, rather than clever and active, betrayed the surreptitious introduction of bloodhound ancestry. Uh, so, explicitly mixed breeds like the currently popular, popular Labradoodles and Cockapoos uh, would not have been appreciated at that time. It could, it could be argued that the term hybrid shouldn't be applied to such crosses between animals whose differences were so minor that very refined human discrimination was required to identify or perceive them. And the Oxford English Dictionary entry for hybrid implicitly endorses this position. With regard to animals, the original denotation, it appears appeared very occasionally in the 17th century with specific uh, reference as apparently in its Latin root, to the offspring of a tame sow and a wild boar. It became common in the 19th century with the more general sense of crosses between distinct species. And this was also when the, weak, the, when the uh, weakened and now common sense of kind of anything composed of different or incongruous elements appeared. Anyway, according to Thomas Henry Huxley, the um, uh, the kind of tweaks to domesticated breeds or varieties that I just referred to were not hybrids, but mongrels, and, and Darwin thought uh, about the same thing. And again, here's Punch's opinion. Um, but there was always a speculative element among cutting edge improvers with regard to animal breeding, uh, as with regard to other, other aspects of animals, that is to just to try things out to see what would happen. It's this free floating curiosity that accounts for many of the attempts to uh, improve or invigorate domestic breeds by introducing the blood of wild relatives, whatever the people engineering the crosses claim. Now, these endeavors, both the successful ones and the ones that didn't work, did provide or seem to provide a way to test or refine the limits of individual species, as well as the definition of species itself. That is, a degree of closeness had to be present for hybridization to work, although how to identify or specify that degree was puzzling. Then as now, the, con the conventional definition of species had to do with the ability to produce fertile offspring. And then as now, the problematical nature of that definition was readily recognizable, although the reasons were a bit different. Appearance and morphology turned out to provide an inadequate basis for prediction, especially for the relationship between wild and domesticated animals. And of course, such technical criteria weren't the only ones in play. And scientists or naturalists who deployed them were not the only people with opinions. Indeed, even the judgments of experts could include surreptitiously uh, criteria that they might have been reluctant to acknowledge. This was especially noticeable in attempts to distinguish between wild species and their close domesticated rel relatives. The cachet of wildness is implicit in the recurrent sense that an infusion of wild blood, even a whiff of wildness, however acquired, would somehow invigorate or improve or ennoble domestic breeds. And it was sometimes uh, celebrated much more extravagantly. For example, it's still claimed that the white cattle of Chilliam Castle in Northumberland are wild animals. Um, although, uh, although this is a Lancier uh, port, family portrait, but they don't live in the family. And these are some of them hanging around um, today. Uh, but recent DNA evidence, among much other evidence, shows that they're descended from ordinary cattle, mostly they, who just happen uh, to live in the way that most domesticated cattle live in the Middle Ages. And to end, more or less, where I began, the current Belgian hares are still rats, even though they have been increasingly bred to live up to their names in phenotype, if not in gene type. So, okay.
you very much for your talk. And uh, the floor is open for uh, comments, questions. Yes, okay. Thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. I was wondering if the hybridization of different kinds of animals led to, to some serious physical and medical problems with those um, uh, animals that led in turn to, to a development of animal medicine uh, or some uh, like a specific form of um, uh, reality in this, uh, in this field. And, and, and I was also want to ask, uh, did the uh, suffragist women have any reaction to this um, experiment? No, I mean, most, most of what I'm talking about happened before, before the, the suffrage, suffragette movement um, really took off. I mean, women, women were involved, were not involved particularly in the uh, hybridization aspect of animal breeding, but they were involved in animal breeding per se in various ways. Um, the, um, the institutions of livestock breeding, uh, at, at least in their earlier, earlier periods, felt that it was indelicate for women to be involved in, I mean, the business of livestock breeding is producing young animals. And given what women normally do, it's kind of funny that they thought um, it was inappropriate for them to do, but they were, but that was the case. And then even um, later when dog breeding and later cat breeding took off, there were um, separate institutions for male and female human uh, breeders. Um, and, uh, and the analogy between um, elite humans and their elite animals, with regard to livestock, you mostly see implicitly men compared to cattle or sheep. But with regard to dogs, uh, women, women also, um, but the, the, the question about veterinary uh, practice is interesting. I mean, in a way, there weren't enough um, to, to make a major, you know, subspecial. And, and, and veterinary medicine itself was slow to differentiate. I mean, even now, if you're a vet, you specialize in ungulates, or small carnivores, but the vets at zoos deal with a much larger range of, um, of species. Uh, so um, I think, I think um, yeah, the, the only hybrids that were produced in any number were the, the, the very easy kinds like wolf dog hybrids, which can be treated just like dogs. Uh, okay, so you we were talking about the, the game uh, versus uh, domesticated livestock meat and also how this uh, practice of, of hunting developed also into some kind of conservation of the forest. So um, does it have any implication on, on conservation practices today? with a uh, connection to those uh, definitions of wild domesticated, domesticated, feral, all those kind of things? Well, it definitely, I mean, current conservation practices derive at least indirectly from the kind of uh, proprietary forests that have been a part of European culture since, since the Middle, Middle Ages. I mean, it's part, you know, you can, I mean, it's, you know, it's not 
it's complicated, obviously, but I think it's possible to see the um, resistance to um, game laws to people being prevented from hunting in nearby in nearby forests as analogous to some of the um, uh, resistance to national parks in places where local people have been prevented from traditional, you know, traditional hunting practices, um, even though, you know, as I say, it, it, it's complicated, it's different in different places, but uh, the sense that the stakeholders protecting the animals are different from the stakeholders who would have been able to exploit and who are exploiting them in one way are different from the stakeholders who would, would have exploited them in a different way if the only protectors weren't there. Uh, it's Like imperial dimension? Yeah, it seems as if you could say it's like a big fake animal from outside Europe and brought them into Europe. Yes. But at the same time, they sent animals from Europe abroad. Yes, yes, yes. It's interesting that they did not even think about what work the introduction of, say, lizards into the hotel kitchen did not work as well. Why could the state consume that, say, in uh, Colombia? So was there anything there that made the, the, the meat very much more for meat consumption, more traditional and consistent than, say, plants? You mean, why were there why were there fewer an edible animals introduced? than edible plants, which of course, of course yeah. Um, probably because domestication is hard. I mean, nobody, I mean, as far as I know, no one in Europe was interested in eating lizards. Um, but it's also true that people are very resistant to changing their habits. I mean, one, um, this is not to do with uh, imperial or anything, but one um, uh, agenda that was attempted in the 19th century in various European places was to get people with horses. And it took in a few places, and it really didn't take in anywhere north of France, um, even though. Uh, it was um, it, it was urged. Well, of course, there were lots of horses. They all died sooner or later. There are a lot of poor people, um, and so um, you know, two gooders thought that there was an obvious kind of synergy there. But um, in most most places where it was attempted, um, it didn't um, it didn't take off. At that. Could say horse meat was served as the Harvard Catholic Club well into the 1960s um, as a uh, kind of reflex from World War II uh, rationing. So I guess Harvard professors less picky than um, some other people. But the, 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 the animals that they would have liked were things like the eel, you know, which uh, is conformed like a cat. Um, but it's it's just too hard. Although I mean a lot a lot of plants took a long time, like the, the potato and the tomato, it took a long time before people reconciled themselves to the fact that they weren't poisonous. So but animals are harder to maintain also, you know, if, if it's not working. Leo. I am hesitant how to raise this issue with 
between the connection, but there is this story uh, about a Soviet uh, biologist, Ilya Ivanov, who did experiments in the 1920s of hybridization between primates and humans. Are you aware of this? I'm not aware of that in particular, but it has been uh, it has been attempted both uh, formally and informally over and over again. So this was a, this was a big project in the Soviet Union, and it had to do also with ideology, in the sense of you know equality between species and things like that. It was a failure, technically speaking. It well, was it always is the same problem as exactly, Gerald and Because that's why I, you know, when you mentioned that, I I went to look. I, I remember that I we once published an article in, in Science in Context about that. And it always said, uh, I mean, I always saw it as something quite isolated, but the, the discourse, well, so you have the technical problems and the other kinds of problems as you mentioned, and I wonder how do you connect or do not connect <laughs> these two kinds well, of phenomena? I mean, I, I also have run across uh, a, a kind of sideshow proprietor who tried to produce such a hybrid just to exhibit, you know, as, as a free. Um, but you have to think that, um, Whatever the, the uh, apparent ideology behind that kind of uh, project, it also reflects the racial, racist taxonomy of, um, well, I Why racist? I would well, say because, anti racist. No, racist, because that's, that separated the human species into various, what we see as one human species, into several species, some of which were considered to be closer to chimpanzees than others. I think they did it with white people in the, I mean, it was- Perhaps they thought the dozer though. Masculine, they say, sperm, well, that, yeah, always yeah, in yeah. that direction. I mean, <laughs> I have also been told by a zookeeper, although you know, this is just anecdotal, that um, uh, that kind of activity goes on in zoos, um, not with the intention of producing offspring, uh, but for other reasons. Yeah, um, I want to thank you so much for this fascinating lecture and I enjoyed reading what you've written about menageries. That's not what I'm going to ask now though. <laughs> um, I'm sitting here with a number of friends and we're all come from a group of the human animal bond studies and um, when you show the images of Sir Edwin Lanzier, his paintings, I always feel that there's so much nobility, like in the Monarch of the Glen and, and some of his dogs that they save darling children and all. It would be hard for me to imagine that someone looking at that painting of that beautiful stag would want to kill it. And I don't really know what Lanzier was trying to communicate there. That, that's one question. And then I just one other. Um, how do you feel about this modern push towards de extinction that zoos are participating in by? All kinds of experiments to bring back species either extinct or almost um well those are those are uh, different things i mean you know i uh, i don't want to kill them <laughs> and i'm not a hunter but it's it's the default it, it, for hunting rhetoric that you both admire and uh, you know, I mean, and there's a rhetoric that that implies, although I think inaccurately, that it's an, an equal contest. Um, that's where they talk about animals that give good sport. That is that that struggle or or uh, oppose, as opposed to those that just kind of roll over and die. Um, so, uh, you know, and there's even a rhetoric that you can see in hunting magazines that suggests that animals willingly participate. Um, so uh, exactly why people think that, I don't know. But do you think Lancier may felt that way? Was he a hunter himself? I, I actually don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. He had, I mean, he had a great, great sympathy for animals. As you know, his, uh, his portraits include uh, domestic pets. Right as well as, and you know, there's there's probably uh, something to, uh, always something to unpack in um, 
the fact that he's portrayed them as a nuclear family, both, both the images that I, that I showed, and of course, that is not the ungulate way. Um, and you, know, you can see something similar in the, what Donna Haraway has written about in the, uh, the dioramas in the American Museum of Natural History in New York, where lots of, of, of like African animals, again, are, persuade, are portrayed as nuclear families, um, which is not. It brings us closer to them. Yeah, yeah. Snake. Yeah, I was wondering. You're talking a lot about hybridization in Europe or in the West, but sort of home West. And I was wondering about colonial West. So, to what extent hybridization was a practice by colonialists coming to other places and trying to improve either the local one, whatever has been with the Winter, or the animals that wrote with them and try to adapt them. Because I know that, that in pre-Israel state, that was a practice that they use, for example, there's an impressive research on that. They use the local cows and wrote Dutch cows and made a hybridization so as to have the adaptation to the climate and, and the whatever quality of meat, whatever uh, the Dutch cow. And I know there are such, such practices concerning goats in other places. So I wonder about colonial hybridization. Well, in, in, the, in the Americas and in Australia and Southern Africa, there weren't such good options. I mean, the, the, the wolves and dogs hybridize easily. And, with, with that and, and, and in in North America, the bison and the cattle hybridize, hybridized. There was some intentional hybrid. You know, at, the American bison are one of the de extinction. I didn't answer that. Um, uh, success stories, apparently. Um, that is, there were only less than a hundred or so of them at one point in the late nineteenth century, and now there are millions. Uh, and they're, they're um, you know, they're, they're, some of them are, are slaughtered for food. And, and, but early in the, I mean, in the late 19th century, there were some ranchers who did produce beefaloes, um, hybrid, uh, hybrids between buffaloes and, um, and cattle. But I think um, that also in the, in the period before the range was fenced in, that the animals hybridized on their own to some extent. And with current genomic analysis, it turns out that almost all the, the buffalo, the bison, now, I mean, they, they look like bison. I mean, they, look, they don't look like cats and they act like bison. But they do have those bits of, um, uh, uh, in them, just like it turns out uh, recently that the European bison, which looks pretty much like the American one, um, turns out to have a lot of oryx in it, which oryx is the um, ancestor of all domestic uh, cattle. So I think on, on the whole, you know, I mean, of course, Israel is a different, different case because it's part of the same old world, you know, geographical area where, I mean, in fact, it's part of the place where domestication of many of these species happened in the first place. Um, but on the whole, what colonists did was swamp uh, whatever was living there with um, their cattle and sheep and pigs. Um, and it was only in places where uh, either the, the environment was unpropitious or the local human population was vigorous enough and numerous enough that it did, that, that didn't happen. Tom? Uh, yeah, thanks for a great talk. Uh, 
thing that are uh, really caught me here is the fact that it seems that you're talking about mostly um, animals that are very prominent in cultural imaginary and in science and in human diet and commercial etc. And usually when I think about uh, I agree with you, I think about uh, category, about uh, entities or organisms that are in the margins of categories. Like you, you were you mentioned before certain human the the the, um, the uh, hierarchy of human uh, races and those who are closer to animals and those who are who are, who are perceived to be uh, further for them. And I think the same goes for in the 18th century, sometimes where um, uh, women versus men, women being perceived uh, as more as a more fluid category that can be mixed with other uh, with other categories. So I, I'm wondering if there's anything specific to uh, the British uh, Empire, the British landscape uh, uh, for or to the 19th century that has to do with going directly to the heart of the animal kingdom and trying to manufacture or improve them. But which would you say was the heart of the animal kingdom? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, you, you're talking about you're talking about horses. You're talking about um, rabbits. You're talking about about animals that seem to me to be uh, very prominent in in our imagination of what of what the animal kingdom is. Well, I mean, in terms of in terms of hybridization. You've got to have both potential partners under your control. Um, so uh, that's um, get it. That that's that's the, the reason for um, the uh, selection. I think now it's it's a thing that comes up a lot when you look into practices to do with animals, and I'm sure we look into the other practices as well, that there are practices that look the same from one culture to another. But in order to tell whether they are the same, you need to know as much about both. And that's, that's a problem for historians who tend to know more about uh, one thing than another. So um, so I agree that it's a, it, it, it's a good question. Um, but I don't have I don't have a good a good um, answer. But I do want to say something about the extension um, because there's a, um, a woman named um, Deborah Shapiro who has written a book called How to Clone the Man. And yeah, and she is the kind of biologist who does that kind of thing. And it's a, it's a very readable, good book. And what it shows is exactly all the reasons why such an endeavor is impracticable and problematic in all kinds of ways. Dangerous. But she also kind of likes the idea of, of doing it. Um, so it's, I mean, it's good scientifically and it's interesting for, um, other reasons as, um, as well. Do you feel it's ethical? Well, of course it depends species by species. Um, I mean, for a mammoth, you know, since a mammoth would have to be, have a, an elephant surrogate mother. And since mammoths, like other mammals, many other mammals, need to be taught to be mammoths, then even, even if you discounted the problems of the interuterine environment and so forth, but there's no way an Afri an Asian elephant is going to be able to teach a, a baby mammoth to be a man. So it wouldn't end up being, it would end up being something, but but not a man, and where would it live, and, and, and so forth. I mean, you know, some, some kinds of things, like some aspects of the Pleistocene fantasies, like there's been um, 
an endeavor in North America, I mean, of course, whacked out like they mostly are, but um, called the Buffalo Commons for a long time, which kind of suggests stopping cultivating the high plains, which should never have been plowed in the first place. They're the reason that they had the dust bowl in the 1930s, they're arid and the soil is light and, and all of that kind of thing. So stop farming and reintroduce as close to the Pleistocene um, bio, biota as 